Welcome everyone to another episode of the Based on a True Story. My name is Matthew Baxter. And I'm Dr. Karen Stolzner. And I'm Blake Smith. You may know me from the podcast Monster Talk, along with our co-host, Karen. And you know Matthew from The Based on a True Story and from Ask a Paranormal Investigator on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Please click like and subscribe. So uh, today yeah. we're going to be talking about a great documentary, uh, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, <laughs> the shocking true story about a barbecue family gone wrong. So I'm... <laughs> I'm very excited about this uh, documentary. I wasn't aware of that when we it, when I watched it, the it, movie. it tells you it's a true story right at the beginning, uh, right at the beginning. And, and, and that's great. You know, that is one of the most interesting <laughs> things that opening, you know, very Star Wars like that comes up and it does sound <laughs> yeah, like very Star Wars like <laughs> I was just thinking that the other day. It's like, that, <laughs> just like that. Yeah. It really does lead you into believing it's a true story the way Absolutely. they position yeah. it. The thing that I didn't mm -hmm. know was that was John Larroquette. John Larroquette. Yes, oh, exactly. Yeah. Cat. Yeah. And I just I did not realize that. And, you know, Karen didn't have the pleasure of getting to watch Night Court as much oh. in Australia, because that's a, really what I knew about him was Night yeah. Court. So uh, to have that voice, you know, telling me the story, I, I didn't fathom that it would be him. So that was, that was kind you of an interesting his way to start. voice or you uh, just found not, out after the fact? I found out after the fact, it, you know, it's just th this, this good kind of announcer kind of voice, you know, this yes. newsreader kind of voice. Very, and very nice. Come on. No voice. idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I don't, I don't think he, I mean, it's, it's definitely a thing that he did. It's probably not high on his IMDb credits that he didn't bring it up. I bet. So. Well, you know, when you go to his uh, Wikipedia page and it says what he's known for, it's not on there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Is it? But uh, yeah, I, you know, you just expect him to make some kind of crack about bowl or, uh, you know, uh, one, one of the other people in night court or something. And, and he doesn't, he just reads it straight and it's uh, very impressive. Mm -hmm. So he did a great job. So this is um, a film by Toby Hooper, and it's one of the um, most successful independent films ever made. I think when it, it, you watch it sometimes, especially for the first time around this era, it's hard to understand why. <laughs> well, yeah, you know what? This was, a, I think middle school is probably the perfect time to be running into this because. Oh, uh, it's a little late then, yeah. Yeah, when I, when I was... I guess it was coming on cable channels at the in the uh, 80s and I heard about it and I had never seen it before and this was you know it was still a time when it was easier to watch something on cable like your home box office or your showtime yeah and uh, that that was there weren't blockbusters everywhere and that sort of thing but I remember my my fellow classmates talking about this incredible terrifying thing they had seen and it sounded First of all, this whole idea that it's a true story, and then how how well they do to present graphic violence in a way that feels like you're seeing way more than you're actually seeing. It's it's and if you get hyped up and scared or go see it at a drive-in with some friends, it comes across more like a snuff film than a like a, a real movie. Like it, it feels very much like you're seeing people die, especially certain oh, scenes. It, but but you're still, right. Still plenty of gore, I think, even what? though uh, you're right. I think, didn't they do that to reduce the... the they wanted to get a lower uh, rating. They wanted to get a PG lower rating. Lower rating. And really? it just wasn't going to... Yeah, it <laughs> which, wasn't going to happen. Because <laughs> they, they thought they could get wider distribution, and which is absolutely true. But no, there was there was still too much insinuated with everything they did. Yeah. It really just the concept of, of what it was and uh, yeah i mean it was still still plenty of blood and guts it, it's very visceral it, it i guess we should probably tell the plot the general idea of yeah who, yeah who wants to tell the plot let's let matthew <laughs> or my, if, it, if it's too on the spot i could take it but yeah or if you I'm freeze just kidding. up. I'm just <laughs> kidding. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> basically what we're looking at here. Now, now, the thing is, is before I go into this, a lot of the, we'll say what's said about the movie these days is that it's got, it's all this political commentary and all this kind of, you know, meaning to it and everything. But the bottom line is it's about these kids, these, these, uh, you know, kind of typical kids in the seventies that are traveling through Texas uh, for a specific purpose we'll talk about in a moment that kind of take a wrong turn in a sense. Yeah, and, it's literally uh, the prototypical teens in a van go on an adventure and it's not a good mm -hmm. adventure. Yeah, it's not a good adventure at all. Now, <laughs> no, not. Now, now, one of the things that I never really caught on to before uh, out of the times uh, that I've, I've seen pieces of it, I've never seen it from front to, to end until the other night. 
Oh, I'd seen pieces of it and I knew the basics of the story. I saw the remake, things like that. We watched it original... together and it was very romantic. I suppose, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Had to keep chasing yep. the kid out of the room and yeah, yep. he kept asking questions and yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, she couldn't keep her hands off me. And there were times when she says, why did you make me watch this? Yeah, it was <laughs> it was uh, it was an interesting thing. Well, anyway, the thing is, is I, I didn't realize before that the reason they were in Texas is because they were trying to visit their grandfather's grave to find out if it had been disturbed by the grave robbers. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. That was the reason they were there. And I somehow missed that in, in uh, all the times. And I don't know if that was really expressed in the sequel or not, or not the sequel, but the uh, the remake. I can't remember if that was the reason they were there or not. It's kind of seemed like they were just hippies traveling across Texas, but mm -hmm. I, I could be wrong. So it, it is interesting. And then they make it to the uncle's house or the grandfather's house. And, uh, you know, Franklin, who is, you know, one of the, the members of that family is a paraplegic in a wheelchair. And of course, he's kind of left behind. He's kind of treated badly. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's just a lot of. Well, I think we should go back a little and, bit and, and, and say there's a lot that... of annoying, annoying things going on with him. But go ahead. Well, I think, yeah, we should backtrack a little bit to say that they well, were the low on gas at, at one point. And so they, right. they pull up at a gas station. And that's where you meet this strange guy who's uh, saying, oh, we're not going to have uh, uh, a shipment of gas brought here until tomorrow morning. So you're going to have to hang out, stay the night. So at this point, I was already wondering if he was a member of, of that family. And he invites them to have some barbecue as well. And, Avoid uh, the barbecue. Avoid the barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I certainly thought too, while they're sitting in the, the, the van, combi van, whatever it is, I can't think of what make and model it was. Uh, looked like it was it a Volkswagen? I'm not sure. It's no, I don't, think, I don't think really so. No. Relevant, but it's a bit of a stereotype in Australia anyway to have a VW kind of combi van and, and drive around hippies Here too. And, and all Here that. Too. It's a, you know, and, there was um, a little bit of a Scooby Doo vibe with the van, but nothing else was Scooby Doo about it. No, yeah, it's and turned out so, to not be a man. In, well, it is a man in a mask. There is that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he so, would have got away with it if it hadn't been for those damn kids. kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we should say, too, that we've, in this series, we've predominantly been looking at paranormal films. And there, there aren't really too many paranormal elements to this movie. I mean, it is a pure horror film. And uh, I, I think that you can kind of slant it to say that there are some paranormal aspects. One of the girls is reading. Uh, from a book of astrology and uh, I think that that's kind of a forerunner to all the things that are going to happen and uh, she keeps kind of pulling that out and, and referring back to that and reading people's horoscopes Sound and we retrograde. should mention yes yeah indeed that was the sign um, that things were about to take a turn and that they pick up a hitchhiker yes they do the way. yes they do. and yeah he's a very strange fellow and I, I don't know how to describe him. I mean, he, they start a conversation about the local slaughterhouse, we'd call it an abattoir in Australia, and how they, they kill cows there. And uh, then what he, I can't remember if he borrows a knife or if he rips he out a knife it. himself. He grabs it yeah, from and Franklin. He just, yeah, slices himself open and starts bleeding. And he's kind of laughing hysterically and really freaking the, the kids out. I mean, if, if you can even call them kids what would you say they're kind of they like teenagers or 20 something they're, they're early 20, 20s 20 yeah, something yeah yeah this, this yeah, feels like almost like a college group of college friends almost so yeah yeah and so this fellow takes a picture of franklin and then tries to charge him money for it and yeah. uh, he he doesn't want to accept the photograph so then what does he do he rips out some foil or something and, and puts the photograph on there and then sets it alight and I mean, he's really it feels almost like a magic ritual, doesn't it? I mean, it, doesn't it? It does, yeah. yeah. It, yeah it paranormal does, aspect. Yeah. So exactly. So yeah, that that's really strange. And so they end up uh, booting him out. And I think already at that point, you can tell that that's not the end of him. It's almost like across his face that looks does. like blood. The birthmark, yeah. yeah. It feels like a like like an urban legend, like it, almost like a warning: don't pick up hitchhikers because you know they may turn out to be cannibals. That kind of thing, right? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. They've got like a, this Franklin character who's in a wheelchair and it's like they're going to like this incredibly rural place in the time before the American Disabilities Act. So it's no small thing. I mean, that's a really interesting choice, I think, for them to have a character in a wheelchair and they never treat him like like they don't. I mean, I don't know how to put this like 
I don't feel like there's a lot of sympathy. Like he's for his different. Character. He's right. he, well, he, he's, he, he's kind of a jerk. Like he's he really is like a really oh. annoying character. They so. made him very unlikable. He is. Yeah. Yeah. And but I, yeah, I, and I think there's that point where uh, later in the film where he and Sally are talking and she is just sick to death of hearing him talk and keeps telling him to shut up. And but it seems like he's maybe a founding member of the community yeah. and that it was his grandfather. Uh, Franklin is that his that's his last name or is that his well, first name? and that was I a confusing sure. thing that because it seemed like the name was the the family name was Franklin but his name was Franklin right it's, it's Hardesty the Hardesty family yeah oh okay that's right so it's, that's it's right You're Sally correct. Hardesty and Franklin Hardesty their brother and sister I believe so yeah and oh, I'm I, wondering if the grandfather may have been named Franklin as well and that's maybe why we we were getting that impression I can't remember to be honest but one of the interesting things is we were noticing the similarities between this movie and one of the, our other Dotes episodes, The Hills Have Eyes. Yes. And, and one of the so. interesting things is she's talking about Saturn in retrograde and the names of the cannibals were actually planet names. Yes. And That's so right. it I thought just, it was always Mer Mercury in retrograde, but. Well, not if we're talking cannibals and chainsaw murders, then it's Saturn. I mean, this is basic 101 astrology. You should know this. But the, the thing is, is it's, it, I think it is, Interesting as we're watching this and then, you know, come to realize that actually Wes Craven was inspired by Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is kind of the movie that started this, this genre. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and, and yeah, again, we'll, we'll talk about other movies that were inspired by the true story behind it. And mm -hmm. one of those movies is Psycho. And it would be, you know, wrong to think that that movie started this genre because Psycho was clearly a thriller. It was not a slasher flick. Mm -hmm. It was definitely a thriller. And, what do you uh, this, call these, Matt, like grinders? Oh, that, that's <laughs> grindhouse. grindhouse. Not, not grinders. Seems uh, like I think there are we'll lots leave, of different we'll names that for this, this genre. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it is It is interesting, you know, just just that kind of thing. But when we want to talk, you know, how these, these kids from there, they, they go and they find the, their old house that they used to visit of their grandfathers and, and everybody kind of gets lost in either nostalgia or discovery if they hadn't been there before to go looking for a kind of a pond to go swim in, uh, swimming in and, and other ones are, you know, kind of hanging around for them to get back and it, it just well, kind of, they get split up. I think I'd like to just to add at this point too, so it's neither here nor there, but I think this is one of those rare films where I had to have Matt translate for me upon occasion because the accents were, were so thick, especially of the family. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, oh, it, it was, you know, because there, there's times strong. that I've had to have Karen translate for me, you know, on Paul some, Hogan, uh, yeah. uh, you know, some Australian films and everything and or family members. And the, and the thing is, is in this case, I, I really did have to translate for her. And I had to sit there and think about what it was they just said, uh, you know, on a, a few occasions and, and to figure out what was actually going on. And, and luckily, Leatherface wasn't verbal. So I didn't have right, to do no. any translating for him. He's so. nonverbal. Yeah. Gunnar Hansen, right? It's it, like he's it, it. He manages to do a lot of emoting. Like I mean, you you, like you can't really say that logically. There's something going on behind the mask, but you you do oh, get the idea. Yeah. He, he's he waiting does... for this moment. Yeah, Matt's yes. met him before. Oh. <laughs> before me me and Gunnar were like like this. I mean, you know, we're just best of friends. Well, I mean, we Unmasked. Were, he, he, <laughs> he, he passed away, but we did everything together for a while. It was great. Actually, we, we met at a, a film festival and a very, very gentle, very cool guy. And uh, he was tall, right? He was like pretty, yeah, he was pretty big, pretty big guy. Yeah. And, and, and he was very cool and, and took time, you know, to, to talk to his fans and everything is, he is, is a real good guy, but so sad, sad to see I mean, him go. He didn't have a chainsaw on him. <laughs> I was disappointed. Um, hmm. in that aspect of it. And that brings up one more thing I just want to slip in here. That was one of the first things that Karen said after the movie was over. She was like, where was the chainsaw massacre? Like one guy got killed by a chainsaw. Yeah, it was largely- Spoiler just alert. Yeah. It's very intimidating. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, right, there, it's, it's not that much of a massacre either, but I mean- It was it is, kind of Texas though. <laughs> it was very Texas. They got that part right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely. Sold some tickets, that's for sure. I think- yeah. uh, I think Toby Hooper well, is yeah, it's uh, a, a very catchy a, name. He's a Texan director, right? He, so. Yeah, he is. Yeah, yep. But you know, it, it, we talk about how he on on the last uh, dose of Poltergeist, he was the the director there, and it's said that Steven Spielberg chose him because of his work on this movie. And mm. I watching it, I I don't really know that I would have chosen him because of this movie. 
And I know that this movie is a classic. I know that it's got so much praise. And a lot of that praise comes from what he did with such a low budget and such a short time frame. And right. I, I know that's one of the remarkable things about it. And he got very creative with that. And that's great. But I tend to think that if I was uh, Spielberg, I would have been looking more at his work like with Salem's Lot. That would have been kind of a little more, you know, along the, the, the feel of Poltergeist than Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, but, yeah. I didn't see the connection immediately either. <laughs> So, but well, what do he, we know? He did, uh, I mean, like he did uh, Poltergeist and then he went on to do Life Force, which is just an mm -hmm. absolutely mind blowing film with lots of nudity. But it is, <laughs> I, I think when I was a younger person, I only saw it as a film where like the villain was naked for most of the movie. But, but uh, going back and rewatching it, it's actually a pretty complicated and, and intricate film. It's interesting to see what okay. Hooper could do with, with, with a budget, you know. So, <laughs> I mean, would, you know, would, he's not a one trick pony. He does a lot. No. So. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, he, he was very busy in his lifetime and, and he's also passed away, which brings me to a question. Do you think that this film was cursed because so many of the original <laughs> people involved are now dead? That's a really good point. It's, I think um, yeah, all these yeah. movies have to be cursed. Yeah. I mean, like the, the it was I only was 50 at, years ago, the original mm -hmm. Dracula, like, like everybody involved in that's dead now. It's weird. Like, I don't that's know. That's well known to be so. a cursed yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did love Salem's Lot though. It's not based on a true story. I, I just, it's really good. So I, I loved it too. I mean, yeah. when I I was pretty young when I saw it, and it uh, yes, haunted again. me. Yeah, and and the thing this, about this it, movie is gonna haunt me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and yeah, you have barbecue already. while you watched it. Did you, did you, we, Lone, we Lone Star beer anyway, and barbecue. And reinvigorated my vegetarianism oh no <laughs> and apparently that's the case too i, I think that matt was uh, checking out the wikipedia page and it seems like several cast members or people involved in the making of the film toby hooper himself vegetarian because was vegetarian it, throughout viewers. the filming wow. yeah and people that were inspired by it actually became vegetarians for a time because of this movie so it, it's an interesting film on eating meat uh oh yeah and i think to, to get back to the plot uh just before they go into the family home and they're checking that out and they're sitting in the car and and uh, yeah eating eating meats and they have franklin kind of lingering on that piece of meat and there was just something uh, i don't know i mean it, it's difficult to tell meat is meat but there was just foreshadowing you got, yeah you have definitely a foreshadowing that this this was human meat this was not typical texas well, i've barbecue. never eaten human flesh to the best of my knowledge i mean aside from eating scabs like like you do but the my, my oh, understanding <laughs> well, you may recall from our, our interview we, we did an episode on of monster talk podcast about interview with a cannibal and they they call the human flesh long pig yes. because we, we, long, long right, pork. Yeah, in some yeah, cultures pork. Yeah. we taste like yeah. pork yeah mm -hmm. so or pork is a good or, choice yeah. i guess slow cooked yeah. human flesh is probably the best human flesh sure. so so yeah. where were we with, with the plot anyway? Because You were talking about where Franklin was uh, sort of left behind as everybody was kind of well, looking around. Yeah, and I thought something was going to happen at that point, and not so. Then you have two of the kids who, what they, they go looking for the water hole, as you said, and it was what a drought season, and the, the, the water hole was waterless. And uh, so what they, I think they went in... Um, search of or did they come across the property i can't remember yeah, they're, they're looking for maybe that since the gas station's out of gas they're, they're thinking well let's just keep go exploring right and they find the farm next door and yeah so maybe, like a generator going or yeah or yeah they, and, clearly they've got something's going on at this other farm because the farm that the, the original homestead is really decrepit i mean um it, that by the way felt very familiar to me because my father and i used to tear down houses and recycle the materials so oh I've yeah been that's in, right so many houses like that where everything you know it's just empty you know except for ghost stories there's nothing mm -hmm. there so yeah but yeah this place um wasn't empty <laughs> it was not they it just kept the freezer going right? well the thing Member, is, is memorabilia when, and collectibles <laughs> well when they actually went in the house itself looked kind of nice i mean the paint on the outside didn't look like on the it was outside not that bad of shape and i mean there was one of the like the the rain gutter was like half painted but the rest of the house looked like the paint was fairly fresh. Well, do you think that they were saying the house that wasn't this, in disrepair at all? Do you think they were saying that they were squatters or that this was the, the no, family I think home? Family home, family okay. home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. in good shape on the outside, but certainly yeah. on, on the inside. 
apparently you, you know pass the cars i think yeah. that they have like on the outside is and that's the difference between the outside and the inside is largely the same as it would have been in the community on the outside local family you know doing well have a business they run a gas station they have a, a well-known barbecue business mm -hmm. but on the inside <laughs> a large are... collection of cars under yes yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 so yeah and you know the the whole like going back to the intro remember the whole thing is somebody's been grave robbing right and so <laughs> there's all the i love the intro because it's got that weird camera noise of the bulb recharging yep oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's like you know <laughs> it's, just, it's very disconcerting but but yeah yeah, yeah you don't you don't know what's going on here and then when you suddenly are introduced to leatherface it, it, does anybody ever call him leatherface they do right and I think that's they, what i, I was do. wondering yeah. too yeah. i mean because yeah i don't remember him actually i know it's your that, brother at yeah times, ex exactly but, uh, just yeah. suddenly out of nowhere this giant guy with a weird mask on comes out hits one of the teen or the young people in the head with a hammer one of the most brutal kills I mean, honestly, oh. it, yeah, I mean, it just because they do the thing where like you've received a severe brain trauma and you twitch. And, you know, I grew up on a, a group of the family who farmed and ranched. And so killing so livestock. there were murders. They were obviously were killing livestock. And the twitch that the actor does when he gets hit in the head with a hammer is so familiar to me from seeing actual animals die. And it's, yeah. it's, it's very disturbing. I mean, it's not real. It's, you're not watching a snuff film. Hmm. But it comes when you're like, again, you're 14 or 15 and watch this, it feels like, oh my God, what did I just see? You know, so. Well, I think it's just so strange the way that that happens. It's almost like he knew that they were there. Yes. He just kind of just pulls he open appears, the door. And grabs it, slams the door. The and what the hell? Well, well there was a lot of yeah. noise going on for a long time. Anybody home? You know, there was yeah, a, yeah, yeah. You, people yelling so, yeah, and walking I, around. So he was just kind of biting his time. But him slamming that metal door. Yes. Yes, it's it's Impactful. as weird as the remember in uh, uh, just another great horror moment is uh, in Nightmare on Elm Street when there's a scene where someone gets pulled through a door. It's very peculiar. Yes. Yeah, and it's like you're if you're watching, I what the hell did I just see? Yeah, yeah. It, it's like it's it's very it's it's so disconcerting. Yeah. Well, it really comes out of the blue too, I and mean, it just makes me think of some of those older. Um, songs on like Bakelite records and, and there's just so much kind of preamble and then suddenly the song starts and uh, I mean just nothing's happening and everything's just relatively calm and then it was a slow out of burn. nowhere there's this 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 brutal murder and everything just really picks up speed from that point it does it does I don't are we going to like go through the whole movie and kind of spoil it because we've got a lot to talk about with um, the inspiration <laughs> so um, well, I, I don't know that we need to just because, I mean, we can touch on things like once they're in there and you're looking at the furniture. Yes, uh, we do need to talk about that. Yeah, the furniture is is crazy. And and Robert A. Burns was the, the guy who put that together, the designer that put a lot of that together. And he was very attached to a lot of that because he put a lot of hard work into it. Now, he's an interesting guy. Like you said, he worked on uh, The Hills Have Eyes as well. He did. Yep. And and uh, he also worked on Reanimators, which so. Talk about film now that come to think of it uh, sorry so yeah <laughs> the, the the jewelry that they were wearing and just the the things that they'd made from bones i think you, the there's a lot of similarities I. between the the two movies yeah yeah, yeah absolutely but yeah it, i mean it was a real house of sorry well i was just gonna say that you know it's it's that we were watching a documentary on the, uh, the texas chainsaw massacre i believe it's called the shocking truth and all of these, these people who have now passed away were still alive for this documentary. And he was one of them. And he came across as so passionate that it was practically creepy. He was creepy. Uh, and then, and then he, he was reminiscent of the, the cook, the guy who ran the gas station and the barbecue. He was mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. reminiscent of that guy. And I think it's more of just his, his passion for his job. He wasn't, you know, obviously wasn't a, a sociopath quite like that. But an, an interesting thing about him, which is very sad, is that he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And rather than going through that, he committed suicide just to avoid having to go through, you know, the, all the, the treatment and the pain of cancer. So it was a, a very sort of a sad and an interesting end to to his life and it's it's very bizarre that so much of what's left behind 
uh, are these these crazy artifacts from his movies that he worked for. But the the yeah, apparently furniture... he did. I was just going to say it, it's very interesting the way that he put everything together and him hearing him talk during the documentary about how he was just picking up skulls and and uh, carcasses and. Road and kill. bodies from the side of the, the road to to create all of this furniture and the jewelry and that he really used what what little they had out there but i guess in the middle of uh, summer in texas he was coming across a lot of carcasses and i, I mean it's a real horror house when the kids start stumbling into the home and you see skulls lining the walls and the the creepy furniture and the, the fur and feathers everywhere it's it's really grotesque and a lot of yeah. it was real and stunk. There were people that would have to run outside and vomit, you know, in between takes. But um, just doing this movie on such a small budget that they had really forced them to film seven days a week, 16 hour days, uh, just to get it all crammed in and get it done. And they got it done in, in very quick time. They still went over budget, but just, it is remarkable what they managed to do. As a horror fan, time. I just want to say, I, I appreciate all that. I mean, not only like, the ingenuity of doing this stuff on the cheap, but the the things that people are willing to do, like here dealing with the smell of roadkill, or mm -hmm. like in the uh, Evil Dead series, you know, dealing with like you know wearing the same dirty syrup covered shirt day in and day out, you know, for shoots. Yeah. There's so many things where people have made these incredible sacrifices to give us not the greatest movies in the world but i certainly appreciate them you know so yeah, yeah right. i think wasn't right. uh toby hooper was commenting afterwards and saying that they all hated him for a very long time for after years. that <laughs> <laughs> it took years for them to cool down on how much they hated him yeah but uh yeah you know, and that's, I, I'm, I'm i'm kind of torn on the guy who played franklin the scene where he uh goes over the side of the hill and he's rolling down the hill that was filmed near the end of all the filming and mm -hmm he demanded to be paid on that day and they didn't have the money and they had to basically go and toby i believe toby hooper wrote him I, I could be wrong on that but somebody got wrote him a check because he's like you're gonna go find someone else to play franklin if you don't pay me now and i thought that was a little this a little disappointing when he rolls down that hill in his pocket he has a signed check and i thought that was a little disappointing that he he you know knew the low budget he knew how hard they were working to get it done and he had to kind of pull that. I would say, know? I mean, to be fair, though, what they created was one of the most memorable person in wheelchair rolling down a hill scene in cinema, except for maybe Father Ted when Father oh, Jack over the side. Well, there's oh, that. Oh, yeah, I forgot and about that. There was uh, was that the, memorable. That was very Friday memorable. Friday the 13th, part two, where they go down the stairs. And oh, then yeah. Mac and Me, I think, would be the other one, which is one of the classic moments. Of, and that's uh, true horror. Wheelchair cinema. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awful, awful. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much more you want to go through the the plot, but you know. Well, just as long as we end I... with uh, like a little commentary on ultimately who survives. We have a last girl, which is kind of uh, that yeah, well, uh, the trope yeah, for all yeah. these slasher movies. The last last girl standing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, well, basically, you have the kids one by one going to this house looking for assistance or then looking for each other and uh, just systemat systematically getting murdered uh, until you've got the last two, Franklin and Sally, and it's late at night and they're uh, just kind of calling out and wondering where their friends are and then go in search of them. And that's when they encounter what, Leatherface and he kills Franklin. And that's another one of those scenes where you don't see what's happening, but you you can tell exactly what's happening. And it's, yeah. it's very dark as well, but it's still very impactful, just the, the thought of, of what's going your, on. Your and mind is how. the best CGI, right? I mean, for sure. Like your, your mind is yeah. the yeah, the, and, the, the, uh, the whole scene with the family where they're having the sort of the weird dinner. twisted dinner party and Sally's at the dinner party trying to like, she wants to escape, but the, they've got mm -hmm. this, you think there's a dead guy sitting there and it turns out he's alive and that's absolutely horrifying like i don't well yeah. and that's one of the other paranormal aspects of this yeah. vampirism so quasi paranormal anyway yeah because i don't he, know if he, they really intended that, it to that be sucking that blood out of her finger seemed to bring him back to life yeah and it yeah. kind of had those overtones of vampirism and something paranormal behind it although you know they didn't follow that at all they kind of just left it as he was a sick oh. puppy 
but the it interesting was shocking thing to find out oh i was gonna let go you ahead. you're gonna no. i think you i think you're gonna say exactly what i was gonna say yeah go ahead i'll let you say it okay <laughs> They were having so much trouble getting the blood to look real that they actually did puncture her finger and actually make her bleed. And he sucked real blood out of her finger. And that would not Pretty happen gross. today. <laughs> you know, just the, the hygienic <laughs> oh, issues and, and all that kind of stuff uh, <laughs> just would not have <laughs> happened today. And, and <laughs> I don't know, because I guess it was like an 18 year old kid under that grandpa makeup. Yeah, wow. he was a young because... kid doing it. And it blows my mind that, that he actually willingly sucked well, I was blood. Like trying that. to figure out if they were saying that he was just a older gent or if he was also wearing a, a mask like leather face. Like it was leather really face, difficult. Yeah. yeah, it was difficult diff difficult to tell. It but, wasn't uh, Dick Smith quality makeup, but it was it was good enough for the movie. You know, it wasn't like little big man. You know, that was <laughs> that was really good. It makeup. worked for what it was. It, it worked it, for what it, it was. Yeah. It was I, I didn't know yeah, that repulsive. He was, yeah. So he and, and it kept you confused. Yeah. Because it looked like a dead old man at first. So they, they did a, a fine I thought job. it was. I, I thought, yeah, I thought. So. so does that mean that the, was he taken out of that room? One of the girls stumbled into the yes. room. And so he was in there. So is that implying that the grandmother was still alive too? Or no, that she was very visibly dead. And... Yeah, she was okay. very visibly so dead. They, they both looked at, to me. Well, you could see part of her skull and everything. I mean, it was much more gruesome. Okay. I didn't look closely enough. It's, yeah. it's not the kind of movie that you want to look closely at. <laughs> <laughs> That's why so many of the effects work so well, because you're not looking closely enough. It, it, the movie yeah, ends think, with... Um, the, sorry, let's go see... Uh, it ends with Sally escaping. She like manages to flag down a trucker and get into a pickup truck and get out of there. Uh, but but then Leatherface is still alive and is standing angrily in the road, dancing around with this chainsaw and this sort of ballet of horror and death. And another this. iconic uh, yeah, it, image. Yeah. yeah, it really that was is very strange. But I wanted to uh, to backtrack too. I mean, there are a few other scenes that are very iconic too, and I think one of those is that the girl who is dragged into the room and placed on a meat hook. So yes, yes, yeah. I, I, another one of those scenes where they didn't have the the blood and guts, but just the the sound the, the, effects, just seeing the, what the, you the did see. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, well, it, was was horrifying. No, it, it, like Gunnar Hansen just appears to just pick her up and slam her down on the hook it, it looks it's very convincing so yeah really well well done in that sense i uh, mean true story beginning aside i mean the way the film is pre like presented it comes across as like i mean clearly as you're watching it you should notice it's put together with cut scenes and transitions and you know it, it's it's a movie but it does feel like in many parts of it, like you're seeing real death happening. And it, it's not- It's almost really, a found footage kind it of- It really feels like a found mm -hmm. footage, like snuff film. It really, that, I think they really did like a really good job. And I, that's Toby Hooper. That's him, you know, working on a low budget. You know, we haven't talked about the Blair Witch Project, but it's the same kind of thing where- with I was very inspired low by cost. this movie too. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and I think inspired by the- the way it was presented and also inspired by the profitability, you know, so. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It was kind of, you know, in that sense, you know, movies like this have a little bit of a screw Hollywood kind of uh, feel to them. You know, we can make a compelling story without that big budget. And it's, you know, that, that kind of, you know, uh, I don't know if I want to say grassroots, but that really down and dirty kind of approach. Well, it is. Does you, you make know, some really nobody gritty... got a letter from the producer saying, "Hey, tone down the violence." Like that never happened, <laughs> right? Like nobody's getting notes from the right. executives. Exactly, exactly. So it, it was just a, an, an incredible film in that sense. So yeah, the the inspiration for this was the a very famous serial killer by the no, name of Ed Gein, and he uh, kind of came to notoriety in the 1950s. And it's hard to say how many people he actually killed, whether or not, you know, uh, he was a serial killer or not. Kind of like, you know, where's the massacre? Uh, well, you, you're not completely people, sure. 
we we know that he was a murderer that he did kill right. at least at one at least woman. Two. at least two at least two but, like at least two okay yeah. so yeah i mean had i don't not sure how you quantify a serial killer and matt and i were talking about this when it comes to mass shootings it's yeah. usually kill me once or... shame on you kill me twice you know shame on me yeah. so I mean, it, it is hard he's... to where do you draw the line he's so famous in 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 the true crime world this is we're talking about ed gein yeah, and uh, known as the uh, butcher of Plainfield, although again that implies like a lot of people died. We don't know how many people he murdered. Like, we know at least two, but mm -hmm. what's super creepy about him is that he was a grave robber and yeah. possibly a necrophile. I mean, we don't know, but he clearly was, uh, you know, the inspiration for many horror film characters. Uh, yeah, I, I have a list of, oh, of, right. some, of uh, yeah, some of them. This, this... So he inspired Psycho, Three on a Meat Hook. Three on a Meat Hook is a, is a huge classic. Mm -hmm. um, classic, yeah. Mm. Sounds it. Is that Spielberg? Spielberg, right? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, yeah, yeah. And it's that was uh, actually written by Stephen King, directed and produced by Spielberg. And Deranged Confessions of a Necrophile. We have Motel Hell. Natural Born Killers, Silence of the Lambs, and the sequel, Hannibal. Ed Gein, the musical, which is a, a huge one. Ed Gein, the Butcher of Plainfield. Ed and His Dead Mother, that was a big one. House of a Thousand Corpses, and its sequel, Devil's Rejects. In the Light of the Moon, and Child of God. Now, in terms of TV, we had American uh, Horror Story, Asylum. But even when it comes to music, Slayer had an album called Season in the Abyss, and, and they had a song titled uh, Dead Skin Mask. Mudvayne had an album called LD50, and they had a song called Nothing to Gein. And I'm really <laughs> sub and, and there is actually a writing credit of Blake Smith. And then I would think so. And then uh, the uh, Ziggins on R Rusty Never Sleeps, they had a song called Ed Gein. And there was also a band called Ed Gein. So this story really just permeated popular culture uh, in, in a way. Lose lots to gain. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned his mother there, and it seems like I, I mean, how much of this was of his experiences and, and what he did was nature, and how much of it was nurture? Well, we'll never know. But it does sound like he had a very unhealthy relationship with his mother, and I think it was what Enough him that and he his, killed his brother. brother. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Certainly, and that so, his mother. Yeah. His, his mother was uh, extremely religious and sounds like he was a bit of a mummy's boy. Yeah, and uh, very much the, so. the brother wasn't so much, wasn't so religious. And it, it does seem as though he, he killed his brother. And was it some kind of farming accident he made it seem like? Well, he, there was a fire on the farm and his brother had been talking. His brother was named George and was, was talking about marrying a widow and moving away. And his brother also teased Ed because he had such a close relationship to their mom. And then there was, uh, they were burning some uh, brush on the farm and, uh, oh, oh no, the fire got out of control. And when they found the brother, he was dead of asphyxiation. Although he had mysterious bruises on his head. So yeah, he had yeah. A blood not force a, trauma to his skull and no, no burns. Yeah, no burns, uh, yeah. So, so it was kind of a, an interesting thing. Very you know, that, plausible that Ed knocked him in the head, left him unconscious in a burning field. And although fire off. has been known to hit you in the back of the head with a sledgehammer as well. It, so. Fire is very dangerous that way. <laughs> very well, much it makes so. you wonder why nothing came of that. Because, well, because uh, it, it seems it, like yeah, he... Ed was apparently well-liked. He was known to be a peculiar fellow, but he was a handy man. He babysat people. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, until he was found to be... A horrible murder. Such a necrophile. stereotype, though, the <laughs> pillar of the community. Yeah. Saturday Night Live, when they did that whole thing with Buckwheat and, and the guy who shot Buckwheat, and they're talking about, oh, yeah, you know, I think it was, was it John David Stutz? I, I can't remember uh, the name of Buckwheat's killer. It's been but, a minute. That was the 80s, right? Yes. Oh, that was, yeah, that was, that was a while ago. But, you know, they're talking about, you know, oh, he was such a quiet guy. He was always so nice. And, well, do you believe he killed Buckwheat? Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, no, <laughs> no, no doubt in my mind. Well, I, well, that's with Ed Gein, you know, he's this this quiet guy. And I think a lot of people at first were like, I, I can't believe that he was mm -hmm. it. But thought always like, the oh, quiet yeah, ones. Yeah, I, I think he did do it, you know. Well, I know, so, <laughs> I think this, it was November 16th, 1957. Bernice Warden was the lady who ran a local uh, hardware store in mm -hmm. the town in Minnesota where they lived in Plainsville. And she had disappeared. There was blood on the floor. And the last receipt in her receipt book 
was to Ed Gein for selling some antifreeze. And so I don't think they suspected anything, but they went out to talk to Ed to see if he knew anything. Mm-hmm. And when they got there, and here's where we enter our like listener warning. It's about to get effed up. Yeah, well, they go in and they find her in the barn, strung up, as they say, dressed out like a deer. Like he had gutted her and cleaned her like a deer. And he had and been building... Go ahead. Uh, what you'd miss, what you'd uh, not said too, is that when they questioned him, he spoke about her being dead, which was a, a clue that she's well, dead. That's why he, they went searching. She, when, when they, when they, when they, like previously in 1954, Mary Hogan had gone missing in town and they didn't find her. And Ed said, "Well, I don't know why. You know, she's not at my farm. She's she's at my house." And he kept joking about it, but. He wasn't really joking because he she was at his house, but just not alive, mm-hmm, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. And so he had actually, when they went into the house, it turned out that he had been going into the graveyard and digging up people, women, and making artifacts out of them. He had like he was building. It was only only women were his victims. As far as I know, it was only women. He was digging up the the bodies freshly as he could. And he was taking the skins and taxiderming and he was building. Remember in Silence of the Lambs, they talked about, and to be blunt, this is messed up, but there was one of the, I think think it was uh, Lecter says he's making a vest with tits. And that's basically what he had done. He was building a suit, a woman's suit. That it should be mentioned here, Ed was clearly, absolutely mentally ill. He had something wrong with it. Schizophrenic and probably sociopathic as well. So this this is, he's not a, 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 as what we would call a transgendered person. He is a seriously mentally ill person. And so I think, unfortunately, I think maybe one of the uh, the fallouts of, of the sort of the psycho, the popularity of it and the Ed Gein story, which I don't even, I'm curious as to how this was covered in the news at the time, because it's extremely disturbing necrophilia gender dysmorphia like all kinds of things going on with ed and you know he's he's not your well he's a dangerous psychopath is what he is Uh, like he's he's not normal like something's really wrong with ed and and he said Um, he wasn't a a necrophile he said he was and we can trust him yeah yeah well he did he 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 got (laughs) really hung up on that stuff He, he was like i'm not a necrophile and it's like also it he smells got, too bad. They smell too bad. That, yeah. If they smelled got, good, maybe I would have. Right, maybe. But but the other thing was like when they they caught him, it was because of the receipt. And he kept making a point like, I'm not a thief. I did not steal anything from the register. Like, like that's really important to him. Mm-hmm. So he's got a really screwed up sense of what's important and what's not important. Yeah, his, his ethics yeah. are a little skewed. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, he, yeah, so he was very mentally ill. So it seems like he had, uh, I think one of the things that he's most notable for were his trophies and the the things that he had uh, collected and the things that he had made. Uh, yes. So I, have, I haven't gone searching, not as much of a serial killer buff as, as you, Blake, and it's Kathleen and, and others, but I don't know if you want to discuss some of the things that were found in his house and it, the, it, the things that I, he'd made. I'm not super confident. It's nasty. If you go to Wikipedia and look up Ed Gein, you'll find a list of the artifacts they found. Ultimately, the people in the town, somebody decided to burn the place to the ground rather than have this be a blight on the community because it was obvious it was going to be a place people who were interested in true crime, you know, even in the 50s, people knew true crime, this kind of horror is going to draw people in to look for mm-hmm. trophies of their own. You know, I've got a piece yeah. of the Ed Gein house. I've got a, I found a piece of taxidermied flesh, you know, that kind of thing. So somebody burned it to the ground to kind of clear up the problem. And, but, uh, and what they said though, is after they documented all of these artifacts that they disposed of them decently. Yeah, I'm not sure what that means. Yeah, it's probably buried them then. Yeah. Well, I have a and, friend uh, who, who, whose father was a in the law enforcement there in town. If you and, heard me uh, breathe a, a sigh of relief, because I thought you were going to say, I have a friend who makes a lot of these artifacts himself. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> so no, I'm no, glad just, that no, that's not where you were going. Her her father was was on the law enforcement. The, the, the sheriff who was involved in the case famously like bashed Gein's head into a into wall. A brick and wall. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like she he was, he was very upset. So and, yeah, and because of that, they had to throw out his original confession. And he ended up dying before Gein went to trial. Like, and people said Heart that failure. 
yeah he said that that mm -hmm. the, the gene case killed him like you know like ultimately so i mean i don't you know it it was it was size like 40, trauma say 46 or something yeah, when he died yeah. he's young yeah so yeah. yeah this case really did affect him well yeah of course his headstone you know for for years you know souvenir seekers would go there and chip off pieces of his headstone Really? So they could take take it home. And then finally in 2000, the whole headstone was just stolen. So it's now an unmarked grave. Have They have not remarked it. So let's go and go to that cemetery and look for an unmarked grave. And you might find but it, it is remarkable. It is. It is. Yeah, they... <laughs> it is remarkable and they haven't well, remarked it yet but you know it's it is interesting that you know his claims when he was in the cemetery his claims was that he was like in a haze uh, and he didn't know what he was doing and then he would come out of it and then sometimes leave empty-handed because oh my god what am i doing type of thing so we we really don't know exactly how deep his condition went yeah but i don't mm -hmm. think they ever deemed him fit for trial he did seem like he was fairly quiet, but the way they portray these killers in any movie about him is a maniacal, constantly laughing, uncontrollably, yeah, just unhinged kind of person. And mm -hmm. it's it's kind of sad because while that's terrifying, it's not fair because mental health issues virtually never result in this kind of behavior. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, that's, and I think in the movie, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the family are, are presented as being mentally ill, and they're laughing maniacally the whole time, and yeah, I think it, in, it was very much a movie of its time where that kind of thing was deemed to be funny, and you know, people were portrayed that way, so it certainly look, would look, be looked at as being very ableist today. Well, absolutely. I did want to mention something that I found really interesting that I came across maybe late last year, I think for the first time, the, 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 we is widely acknowledged that Ed Gein's story was the basis for the, the book and the movie Psycho. So Psycho came out, uh, the book came out in, I think, 59. Yes. And then the film came out. Yeah. And the film came out in 1960 and Hitchcock famously, like he knew most people didn't know about the book. So he wanted to keep it super secret. Like don't tell anybody the plot twist because when you watch Psycho, it's a real surprise because like much of the movie you think maybe Norman's mom may be involved. And then when you find out what's really going on with her, it's whoa, what a twist. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but, but it turns out that when Robert Block, who wrote the story psycho, he wrote an autobiography and admitted he didn't know much about Ed Gein. He didn't really know much about that story, but he, you know, it was mm -hmm. an inspiration, but there's another inspiration for that story, which is someone he did know personally, and it's not a very well-known story. And I'd love to share that. Okay. And that is the story of Calvin Thomas Beck. Now, horror fans will know Calvin Thomas Beck as the editor and producer of the, the magazine, The Castle of Frankenstein. And Castle of Frankenstein was kind of a a, a competitor or a, a fellow horror fan magazine along the lines of Famous Monsters of Filmland by Forrest Ackerman. And so from 1962 to 1975, Castle of Frankenstein was on the newsstands out there like sharing monster stories and behind the scenes movie stories. But mm -hmm. Beck himself is this really interesting character who was a big fig figure in fandom. He was connected okay. to the Lovecraft circle. So he would have been connected to Robert Block through that Lovecraft circle. And this is largely coming from the work of Tom Weaver, who's written lots of stuff around B-movies. He's uh, author of a blog called The Monst the Astounding B-Movie Monster Archive. And he also uh, writes and has written books about monster culture and monster movies and that sort of stuff. So Beck was this incredibly influential fan and he had this monster magazine, was super popular. And he was friends with people like Lynn Carter and Robert Block and others. But he was also like this sort of large figure who was absolutely dominated by his tiny and shrill mother. She oh. traveled everywhere with him. She like, he mm -hmm. couldn't go anywhere. He would take college classes. She would come into the college class and like, just sit there and make comments the whole time. Wow. And like, if he went to a dinner, she would be there and like constantly berating him and knocking him and like just belittling him. But he loved his mom. Like he, he stuck by her or put up with it, but like, it was this weird relationship. And like anybody who met him had to meet his mom. 
and it was very it was like this this open secret that like oh my god calvin thomas beck he does this amazing fan work he does this amazing magazine and he's completely controlled by his mom ultimately she becomes enfeebled by uh disease and as she's dying she's in like a, a sick bed upstairs and just yelling down and commanding him to do stuff and so wow. Block knew about this and absolutely it, multiple people have uh, concluded that this was a much bigger influence on him about how the relationship psychologically between Norma Bates and his mom played out because he had this real world model that he had seen firsthand with, with Beck and his mom. And so well, I don't see. It sounds Nobody's, like this, this uh, was able to, I'm sorry, like, uh, it just seems like this was able to actually fill in some of the blanks on the Ed Gein story as well. You know, a after Psycho would have would have come out that people could have, you know, maybe, like I said, use this story to fill in some of the blanks if that's the same type of woman yeah. uh, to draw different kind of conclusions. Sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. No, no, it's okay. I was just going to say, nobody's accusing Beck of being a serial killer, but as far as <laughs> Block knew him real world, and everybody who met him had to meet his mom because she was always there. And she was just mm -hmm. such a peculiar person and like just had such an outsized influence on his life. It was a oh. much bigger um, sort of real world inspiration, I think, for that kind of a character relationship. So, And I, I know this woman. Back when I was uh, about 17, I had a band. And we were, you know, playing good 80s rock music. And we were able to take over this karate dojo dojo for our rehearsal space uh, when they were not having classes. And one day we're in there playing and the door swings wide open and in comes this woman and this sort of small, feeble looking kid carrying a, a keyboard. And she looks at us and she goes, this is Gabriel. He's going to be your keyboard player now. And we were all instantly <laughs> terrified of her. We were not going to argue. Yeah. <laughs> so he sets up and it was a complete catastrophe, but this woman terrified us and terrified him as well, obviously. So I'm expecting to see his name in the news any day now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, again, just for the record, as far as we know, Calvin Thomas Beck never killed anybody. It was not a murderer, but boy, He's better at covering it up. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. was really great coming up, but his mom was a monster, uh, a fur coat wearing wow. tiny New York monster. So, wow. No, yeah, that's a like, one other stopper my mom will shoot. But yeah, it, it, one thing I, I, I think uh, Karen was just sorry to go here is it also mm -hmm. seems uh, that Ed, Ed Gein may have been influenced himself by something in the past that, that wasn't yeah. his mother. So yeah. he had his so, own influence. Um, yeah, another connection, a historical connection to Ed Gein and to just some of his crimes. I mean, grave robbing and then taking trophies and creating all kinds of creepy artifacts from skin. So I'd like to say that this was urban legend and there's a lot of discussion about this too, but this goes back to the Holocaust and to claims made about the Nazis and the concentration camps and so unfortunately, I'm sure many of us have heard of stories of lampshades being make, made from human skin and soap being made from humans and just shocking stories like that. And it seems like there, there was an actual historical case of human skin being made into a, a lampshade at uh, Buchenwald concentration camp. And so I think when the, the Americans came in, at the end of the war, when they were liberating people from the camps, Eisenhower had gotten his troops to take pictures, photographic evidence of the things that they saw. And I think that they also had things on display. So this is only at Buchenwald, not at other at Auschwitz or other camps, but only there. And they, they had items on display to members of the local German towns as well to just show some of the the atrocities and things that the, the Nazis were doing. But there was one commandant, his name was uh, Koch, and he had commissioned a lampshade made of, of skin. And once the higher ups amongst the SS knew of this, they confiscated that. But it's just very shocking. There, there have been other cases where people have claimed to have lampshades that were made from human skin and they've been analyzed and uh, found to be cow hide or uh, goat skin or other things like that. But uh, yeah, it's just very shocking to think that this had happened and that was newsworthy at the time that Dean decided to do these things himself. He was 
reputedly influenced by these stories of what had come out after World War II. Yeah, and they, yeah, I mean, you there there are, there is lots of evidence that the Nazis were doing all kinds of things. They were taking gold teeth out of people's mouths and they were certainly seizing prosthetic legs and personal possessions from people. So I, I think it's... Well, I th- there's that whole thing with the, the Holocaust deniers. You know, there are stories about, in addition to the human lampshades, and there's also were the people rendered down into soap, that kind of question. I, I mean, it's that whole thing about whether or not those stories are true, like, you know, the disposition mm-hmm. of the body parts, like still millions of people died. I mean, like, you know, like if folklore, well, like if real things happen or folklore emerged around those horror stories, it doesn't diminish the fact that they died. Like they absolutely really died. Like, and, and I just hate it that the, the Holocaust deniers are trying to like, you know, well, that part might not be true. So therefore the whole thing might not be true. And that's but, not really, but yeah, it is. it's like I a mean, house there, of cards or this, something. Well, yeah. And the, they do definitely use that to undermine the claims in general, but it's a, it's derailing the, the conversation, but it, it is, it is true. It's not urban legend. It did yeah. happen. And there were other, other artifacts that were found too, like shrunken heads uh, of prisoners and sections of tattoos that had been cut off from people's skin and dried out and certainly with the things that we know of Joseph Mengele that he had was performing all different kinds of experiments on people especially twins and that they had taken trophies of people's organs and and just various other body parts tattoos Uh, so I'm sorry tattoos yeah Yeah, specifically specifically tattoos but yeah I mean so it's not not urban legend It, it was only one case but it certainly doesn't detract from the numerous other atrocities that were uh, committed by the Nazis. And it's another derailing uh, part of the conversation when people talk about how, oh, well, that wasn't sanctioned by the Nazis. These people were rogue when, you know, when they did this. It was not you know, ever sanctioned, and the Nazis shut it down as soon as they found out. Who cares? You know, well, with yeah. everything else that went on, it was, it was all bad. You know, absolutely. I think the kind of thing that you could expect that they would have done, knowing all of the mm. other atrocities that they well, committed. Yeah, power. But they didn't corrupts. make any systematic attempts to 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 make lampshades or anything. But that's certainly aside from the point that six million people died. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's got some. But yeah, that's just a just a very yeah just a horrific story or in in this this movie plot obviously it's it's fiction but to some extent based on these true stories that are then well this true story that's then based on this the stories that are coming out about nazis too so yeah it really sends you down a rabbit hole looking into this Absolutely. i just want for the record though i'm still gonna eat barbecue <laughs> For the record, I'm still not going to. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and that's another one of the interesting things about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in general is, and and Ed Gein, is it has created a huge uh, kind of subculture of dark humor around it, you know, with nothing to gain and and, and stuff like that, that there is this dark humor. What was it? The, was it Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 that was basically a parody that, that Toby Hooper had done? Man, I have such a strange story about that film. I went to see, some friends of mine went to see the Text Chester Messenger 2, and I went to see a John Candy movie that came with the Eugene Levy that came in around the same time with the security guards. And and I, I saw my movie, and they were still stuck in their film. And I was like, what's taking them so long? And I went to check on them. And what had happened was that they were watching Text Chester Messenger 2, and it kept breaking. And the film kept breaking and breaking and breaking. And so it they finally First. got it fixed and then i ended up staying and watching it with them it what a peculiar film it does feel like a pair it's kind of like you've got evil dead and the evil dead 2 is basically mm-hmm. the same story redone turned to 11 you know yeah and this one is sort of the same same kind of deal where it's kind of the same kind of story but it's very silly it's 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 a very weird and silly sort of uh, far Dennis take on. Hopper was in that Dennis one? Hopper is like Lefty Enright. Is that right? I have, I have not seen this movie since it came out. Tessa's Chainsaw Massacre 4 that had Matthew McConaughey. And, you know, it's like there, there were some big names associated yeah, with like, these sequels. As Renee you Zellweger might have been in that. Yes, yes Renee yeah, Zellweger yeah. was in it. Yeah. yeah. They both got a, a big start for them. Yeah. So yeah, well, a, I guess the legacy. it's a kind of coping mechanism, really, to, to make light of these kinds of topics and find some humor in it. Otherwise, it's, it's a very unpalatable topic. That's a great Gall- point. Gallows humor, yep, yep. That is a great point. 
Wow. Well, what do you think? Did we did we kind of cover this? I did want to ask is 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 they say that the original had a lot of political commentary to it. I I kind of missed that. What 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 do you get from that? I, you know, it came out the year after the Nixon resignation. I I don't maybe I don't know. I hmm. I didn't see it. What I saw was a very low cost horror film with a, a a really high return on investment. Like I mean, I think it was disturbing and disorienting and mm -hmm. influential and surprisingly well put together for the low cost. And I, I'm glad that Hooper had a great career after this. People say he had drug problems. I'm not sure what drugs he was on or whatever but i mean he managed to produce a lot of influential art that was still with us today so i you know i'm, I'm okay yeah. with it so <laughs> well, I, I think we're about ready to slam the steel door on this episode then yeah yeah all right in, in my nightmares too yeah <laughs> <laughs>